Well, I admit I didn't see it coming, but I'm not supposed to see it coming. It's a stealth bomber. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Little here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and this is your right angle on the B-21 bomber, uh, which, as you know, I'm a big fan of military hardware and have been for quite a long time. And, you know, full disclosure, I'm embarrassed to say, quite surprised, actually, to say that I had not even heard of the B-21 until just a little bit earlier today. But the reason I heard about it earlier today is because... Um, I have been a vocal critic of both the F-35 uh, program in terms of its procurement. It's, it's a trillion-dollar program. And also, uh, I've been a, a pretty vocal critic of the jet. Uh, this would also be a good opportunity for me to demonstrate the fact that uh, little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> that makes me a heavily armed individual. Uh, the, uh, the initial criticisms I had of the F-35 program, which might criticisms about how it was paid for and how much it cost stand. But the idea that the jet is junk uh, was the result of an F-16 beating the F-35 in a dogfight a couple years ago, significantly outperforming it. And what I hadn't realized uh, until I talked to some of my fighter pilot friends was that, number one, the weapons that the F-35 can deploy can be deployed at any angle. It doesn't need to get in a dogfight. You can be flying away from a jet and put, put a missile out there and, and, and kill it. But much more importantly than the technology, what we're finding is, is that the um, Air Force pilots who were in the F-35 simply didn't realize what the jet was capable of. Hmm. They simply didn't realize what that jet was capable of. So it's a chance for me to apologize a little bit on behalf of the F-35 performance anyway. But uh, Steve, let's start with you. Um, we have a very high likelihood that this will be the last manned bomber yep. built by the United States. Uh, it's expected to enter service in the mid-2020s, I believe, somewhere in there. Yeah, 2025. And I wouldn't be surprised so if it ended up being a little late, though. It's kind of A little bit late. And is apparently, I got this from you before our, um, our show, on our backstage show, is expected to last into the 2080s or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, right now, the workhorse of heavy bombing, if we really want to put a bunch of iron on a target, is the B-52. And there are people who are flying B-52s today whose grandparents flew the B-52. Yeah, yeah. That that jet's been in service for 65 years, something like that, and is expected to stretch another 10 or 15. A little longer than that, yeah. believe it or so, not. Yeah, so uh, upgrades in some planes are just well-designed. Uh, what do you think about the, the B-21? It's actually, to the untrained eye, it is virtually identical to the B-2. Uh, it is cleaner. There's not quite as many little um, inlets and outlets and so on, so it should be even stealthier. I guess my question for you, Steve, is if this is going to be the mainstay of our um, of our of our bombing uh, Air Force bombers' capabilities for the next 60, 70, 80 years, do you think we will be willing to deploy them? Because there's been a fair amount of discussion about whether or not the B-2 should be deployed in active combat situations simply because of its cost and the fact that we have so few of them. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, the, the original plan for the uh, for the B-2 Spirit, which, by the way, B-21 Raider is a much better name. Spirit is just yeah. a lousy name for a bomber, even though it's a magnificent machine, just not a good name. Uh, the, the, the B-2, we were originally supposed to build uh, uh, 80 or 100 of those, and instead we built, I think, 22, and we uh, we lost one uh, in an accident in Guam That's right. a couple of years oh. ago. So we've got it's a tiny fleet, and there there comes a point where can you afford to lose one? And so instead, we're sending fifth generation heavy bombers against right. huts in Afghanistan. It's 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 a little bit silly. The plan now is to build a minimum of 80 to 100 of the B-21 Raiders, and perhaps as many as 200. I, I hope we live in a world where we don't need that many. Heavy Heavy bombers, but uh, I, I'm not gonna. I wouldn't pin my uh, hopes on that too much. Uh, that said, what you have to imagine is taking the lessons we've learned from the B-2, the F-22, and the F-35. Uh, one of the reasons the F-35 performed so well at the uh, the Red Flag exercise at, at Nellis is its, uh, it, it, its battlefield uh, eyesight. It gives every pilot the view of God, and he can share that view with every other plane. They had guys uh, in F-35s at this, uh, at this Red Flag exercise who were out of, uh, you know, pretend missiles. They couldn't fire anymore. <laughs> but the guys in F-22s 
wanted them to stay in the battle because right. the F-22 Raptor Sensor got, platform. Yes, got a better view of the battlefield from the F-35 flying next to them than they did from their own sensor suite. It's wow. amazing. So if, we, if you take the, uh, the heavy lift and stealth ability of, uh, of the B-2 and combine it with the, 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 the God's eye view of the F-35, you're talking about a remarkable bomber. And if that isn't the future of our bomber fleet, it had better be because the, the, the B-1, the B-2, and the B-52 are all scheduled to start retiring in the mid-2030s uh, and finish retiring by 2050. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about trying to build 200 bombers at a, at a build rate of maybe 10 a year, we got to get cracking on this. Yeah. Well said and extremely informative. Oh, thank um, you. you're, you're welcome. Uh, Scott, the entire purpose of the B-2 is to penetrate enemy radar defenses and so on. There's some talk about how some modern radars render stealth completely useless or so on. I'm, I'm not even going to get into that discussion with you. But what does interest, interest me is this. This is likely to be, as I said earlier, I think the last manned bomber built by the United States Air Force. Do you think it's important to have a human being sitting uh, in the cockpit of a, of a vehicle that's being sent over to drop uh, almost certainly going to be conventional weapons, but certainly the, the aircraft is designed to deliver nuclear weapons. Do you feel like that is something that we should have uh, an automated pilot on? Well, let me, let me get to that in a second. First of all, I'm encouraged that uh, the B-20, that Bill hadn't heard about the B-21 because maybe somebody is observing OPSEC. I mean, maybe we're <laughs> We're, maybe we're actually not just... I'm sorry. I, I became momentarily confused <laughs> and disoriented. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a possibility. Yeah, that, that. Would be, that would be great if, if somebody in the government was actually not blabbing about every single thing we're doing all the time. Um, so, so that's encouraging to me. Um, the, uh, as far as the, the B-52s go, um, I didn't even know those were still in use. The last thing I heard oh, was yeah. Planet Claire and Rock Lobster, and I have not heard anything <laughs> from them since then. <laughs> so, not even in your own private Idaho? No, I had not. Um, but actually, um, I'm reading, uh, as I've, our members are tired of hearing now, I'm getting through finally the third volume of Winston Churchill's biography by William Manchester and, and Paul Reed, and the unbelievable losses of flight crews involved in the British bombing of German cities when, uh, when the Germans were you know, conducting the blitz against London and bombing everything in England. And they were British had only really the only retaliatory efforts they could muster. They couldn't put an army on land. They were getting wiped out by U-boats in the Atlantic um, and in the English Channel. And elsewhere, the only thing they could really muster was RAF uh, bombers flying over German cities. But the, it was incredible. They could make planes faster than they could make crews. It is easy to make a plane. It's expensive to make a pilot. And so I, I guess, in a sense, I don't mind that the planes are being flown by a guy who's sitting in Kansas somewhere staring at a few monitors. Um, that, may not, that may not necessarily uh, be a bad thing. I have one personal encounter uh, with a stealth. In this case, it was a stealth fighter. I went to the Willow Grove Air Show years ago with my brother Jim, who's a, a pilot for United Airlines, flew an A-10 Warthog tank killer jet, flew some helicopters for the Army. Um, and uh, they had the big, the big thing at the air show was that they had this stealth fighter. And everybody was all excited. So, you know, people kind of mill around at air shows and pay attention to some things and don't pay attention to other things. But in this case, everybody was lined up. You know, everybody's up against the fence and they wanted to see this flyby of this stealth fighter. And this thing uh, finally comes by and the announcers are talking over the PA system and here she comes and everything like this. And this thing made the most horrendous noise of anything I've ever heard. And I turned to my little brother, who's taller than me and smarter and, and better in every other way, and I looked at him and I said, I, I thought that this thing was supposed to be a stealth fighter. That's the worst noise I've ever heard coming out of any machine in my life. And he said, well, the enemy never hears that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think to a, to a certain extent, I, it made me sleep more soundly knowing that we have such technology and these expensive fighters and these expensive bombers that we never want to use become more expensive if you only make 22 of them. It's the development cost that really runs up the cost. And when we say, oh, well, the, the fighter costs $35 million a piece. Well, not if you make 200 of them. Well said. 
Well, a couple things just to respond to there. There is a sound that a high-performance jet makes. You can certainly hear it on uh, F-15s and F-16s, F-22s and F-35s especially. And that is the sound of a, at an air show of, a, of an American fighter jet in a high-G turn. And you can literally hear the air being ripped apart. It's not just the sound of the motors. Yeah. You can hear the it's like yeah. It's like a tearing of canvas. It's just, it's the sound of this jet just tearing the air apart. That's what freedom sounds like. And I know that sounds like a, a chauvinistic Neanderthal knuckle-dragging thing to say, <laughs> but it's actually not. Yeah. People look at what the cost of this program will be, along with the cost of the F-35, and so on, and so on, and so on. And you ask yourself, well, what could we have bought with the trillion dollars that we spent on the F-35? But that's not really the question. The question really is, what about the $71 trillion of private property and, and, and just things in America? Those things are protected by our expenditure on defense. And the reason I was pleased to see um, the B-21 program as, uh, as, as far along as it was, and I'm also very pleased that they actually seem to be watching the budget, but technically that's not really the issue. The issue is pretty simply this. Are we going ahead or are we going behind? There is no standing still. The Chinese and the Russians are managed to copy a fair amount of our stealth technology. Are their jets any good? I don't think they're as good as they think they are. There's a lot to be said about an airplane that has a operational history and certainly the crews that can, can flight them. But we're either moving ahead or we're moving backwards. My father told me this when the American civilian SST was canceled. He was very upset by it. Senate canceled it. The Boeing 7700, I think it was. And he said, you're either going forward or you're going backwards. Our enemies are going forward. We need to be going forward as well. We make the best stuff in the world. We have the best crews in the world. We have the best operational capacity in the world. We have the best logistics in the world. We need to keep it that way. Uh, I'll just close by saying something that was um, reminded uh, to me by Scott's remarks about um, Winston Churchill, who as a young man was part of the last cavalry charge in the British Empire. Yeah. He was the first uh, Lord of the Admiralty during World War I, and briefly uh, first Lord during World War II before becoming Prime Minister. Winston Churchill's life chronicled the fall of the British Empire def despite his best efforts, and their finest hour was in fact pretty nearly their, their, their final hour. The reason that Great Britain is no longer the power that it used to be is, I think, extremely simple, can be put in one very simple idea. For the years that Great Britain was the predominant power in the world, it was the policy of the British government, and this was very simple policy. We will spend whatever we have to spend so that the Royal Navy is capable of defeating the second and third largest navies in the world combined. And we will continue to spend that money for as long as it takes. An island nation with the best navy in the world made a commitment to spend what was necessary to defeat an alliance of the second and third biggest navies in the world. And that commitment is what kept the British Empire, the British Empire, and safe. If we lose that commitment to continuing that, that sense of yes, defense is expensive, but not defense is a lot more expensive, then we're in trouble. So I'm heartened by things like that. I'm heartened by things like the SR-72. I never thought I'd see anything better than the SR-71. SR-72 appears to be unmanned. I don't know how real it is, but the fact that we're going faster and higher is good. This is actual progress, progressives. This is not, this is not the idea of progress <laughs> yes. being sitting around in a bunch of mud huts, you know, picking insects off each other and burning our sustainable cow patties and, you know, trying to raise money in a bake sale of our granola for the Guatemalan water snake. That's not progress. This is progress. And I'm happy to be, uh, happy able to make a report like this. That'll do it for your Right Angle for today. It's all made possible by a very small number of people who have had the generosity and the vision to pay to make these programs possible. If you've been enjoying this program and you're not one of those people, <laughs> you can go to BillWhittle.com and become a member. We certainly would love your help and we Please need it. Do. That'll do it. We'll see you next week on Right Angle. Thanks for everybody. Uh, I'm Bill Whittle and we'll see you next time.